This is a 2010 Honda Insight, a seemingly boring little front-wheel drive hybrid that likes to make you wonder why I'm even talking about it. But the reason is this, that there, that's a Mugen badge. Mugen is the company that fiddles with Hondas, turning family cars into track day specials and occasionally builds some cool Super GT cars, like this one. But this thing's an eco car. What's Mugen's game here? Do they put 3S LiPo in this little Kyosho? Well, the answer's found on this page. Where you see normal body kits go for downforce, well, actually they're mainly there just for looks, but technically body kits are meant to provide downforce, which helps cornering at the expense of straight line speed due to increased drag. But Mugen's body kit helps smooth the airflow over the entire car, improving efficiency and thus in theory top speed. Cornering be damned, this aero kit is all about slicing through the air. And we can test that. Well, no, we can't because GT7 doesn't have the insight, but it does have other eco-focused cars, like this Prius. And since these aero parts are just made up anyway, and many of the races in GT7 feature a fuel strategy component, wouldn't it make sense for the aero parts of eco cars to reduce the drag coefficient rather than to increase downforce? Polyphony Digital do add a lot of tiny unnoticed details to their games, but I highly doubt they've thought of this one. But let's go testing it anyway. At first I took the stock car out to set a benchmark, and that mark is 195 km per hour at the 3000 meter marker. Just side skirts, that's 195 km. Side skirts and a front spoiler, 195. Add a rear wing to complete the package, 193. So the Prius remains boring then, no cool aero tricks that could have made an aero kit an interesting choice for races that are tight on fuel or energy. So we know that aero in GT is all about downforce and not efficiency. So like every other sim out there then. But is it modeling downforce as in actual downward pressure on the car, or is it just making the tires grippier? Here is some American muscle on steroids. I have taken this Hellcat and given it more power and less weight. I want all of that straight line speed. But then for the top run, I have added the most obnoxious wings GT Auto had on hand. The result here is speak for themselves, especially if I freeze the frame right here and show this wheel arch. The gap the stock car has in the bottom image is gone because of that obscene wing pushing the rear of the car down. PD might have dropped the ball on eco aero packages, but they did really good work here. Squatting on the suspension though is not the only thing that a high downforce will cause. In theory, when the front wheels are squished into the tarmac, the steering should get heavier. If you don't have power steering, that is. So let's try to test that. Try being the operative word. I wanted to find a car with little to no downforce that I could apply loads of frontal downforce to. I was really hoping I could bolt some crazy front wings to a canoe like this nonsense. And I did find a viable canoe, but Kaz says no. In the end I took this beast out for some circle work with high and low downforce configurations. I recorded the readings on my wheel to tell me if one was causing more resistance than the other. But no, they were largely alike, and later to confirm I pumped up the wheel torque to the full 11 newton meters, but both configs were pulling over 10 newton meters in turns. So a null result here then. Completely inconclusive, and this is going to remain an open question until there is a car that comes stock with little to no frontal downforce but you can attach huge wings to, but also doesn't have power steering. Someone in the comments can chime in on this one. There has to be some car out there that fits the bill. So far we've just been tackling the curiosities. I want to know the impact of downforce in racing. In the real world, race engineers would spec high downforce for tracks like Monaco and strip it all off for tracks like Monza. There is never one fastest aero config, it all depends on the track. So to test here, I want to test in two parts. Since we don't have Monaco, and PD, what's up with that one? We'll make do with Sakuba, which, well, you know, it should benefit from high aero. Even if it's kind of a power circuit and for low downforce, there's always Monza. At first I took the GT500 NSX out for a spin because aero is all about racing, so why not use a race car? And I did get some results, the low DF setup was quicker, but not by a lot and honestly it was not quicker by enough to give me confidence that it wasn't just my driving making the difference. And it makes sense. Race cars already have a ton of downforce, even in low downforce configs. The front downforce here goes from 650 to 750, which is only a 13% difference. What I really need is a road car with zero out of the box downforce and this MX-5 looks like just the ticket. And man, these new physics really hit you when you go from race cars to old road cars. This MX-5 is a benchmark in handling, but after that GT500 NSX, it just feels like a boat. 
After getting a feel for it, I got my best time down to a 112.4 with an optimal time just a tenth quicker. Then I went full ham at GT Auto, buying all of the aeroplastic I could. After dialing it all up to 11, I hit the track again. The wind here is in a slightly different direction, but look at this lap time. That's faster on lap one. By lap three, it's no contest with the high downforce MX-5 being half a second faster. But maybe this isn't the whole picture. Maybe I'm just getting faster. So I stripped all that plastic back off and hit the track again. But I was instantly off the pace with my best ending up another 112.4, matching the initial time I did with the low downforce config. Which is good news for the high downforce config. Both the GT3 NSX and the Rode MX-5 were faster with barn doors attached. But now that we've seen a positive, can we prove a negative? Can a high downforce setup be slower? Well, here is Monza in the MX-5. Initially running stock without wings, I can only manage a 231.7, which I immediately blew away with a 231.4 with the aid of all the wings. So of course I took the wings off again and set a 231.2. I was not happy with any of this testing, the, the time seemed more dependent on how I took each chicane rather than the car's aero. The right bounce over a curve can make or break the entire lap. All I can really say right now with confidence is that it's close in terms of lap time. In terms of feeling though, it was no contest. The car felt really skittish without the wings. I was curious as to exactly how much aero was affecting the straight line speed and taking the MX-5 out to the test track reveals that the stock aero MX-5 was hitting 207 at the 3 km mark, whereas the full aero version is only managing 196. That's an 11 km difference, but only after 3 km of going full throttle. So even at Monza, is that really going to make that much of a difference? I wanted to see the effect of a greater delta between high and low aero configs. I thought putting aero in a car with none to begin with would be best, but maybe not. Now I have no clue what these numbers mean, but in total we have 500 points of aero we can add to the MX-5. With the GT3 NSX, the delta between high and low downforce is only 400 points, which seems like a problem. But aerodynamic drag also squares with speed, and so I'm thinking that even though on paper it seems like the MX-5 will have a bigger delta between high and low downforce configs, on track it might be a totally different story. To get warmed up, I did 5 laps in the NSX with its lowest aero config, setting a time of 136.016. Then maxing out aero, I could not get near that time, only hitting a 136.2. But just to make sure, I went back to a low config again and, well, smashed that time by one second faster with a 135.2. To see where this speed is really coming from and to try to separate my driving from car performance, let's study some side-by-side -side runs. Starting out with the MX-5 at this white line by the end of the straights. You can see that by the time our rear wheels go over, on the left, the car is at 186, whereas the car on the right is 4 kilometers slower to the same point. Through the first turn, the apex speed is now 53 versus 55, which makes sense. The car without downforce has all the straight line, while the car with the wing has all the cornering. But on exit, you can see that I get way too much curb on the right. My bad driving is interfering, negating any advantage that the winged car should have. They both exit the curb at about 98 kilometers per hour. But in the run down to the 150 meter marker, the non-winged car has pulled out a nice lead and hits 174 while the winged car is only hitting 171. Both cars look to take this chicane about the same, but checking on the exit, the low downforce car is going about 2 km per hour slower. But even before the next corner, the cars are about equal in speed again. Now this next corner is really interesting. You can see how the low downforce car shows its lack of downforce. I need to correct a slide mid-corner and there's a huge difference in apex speed. Still though, the slide didn't cost that much and the high downforce car only exited the corner with one kilometer per hour more in its pocket. By the exit of the corner Martin Brundle used to call Lesbo 2, the cars are neck and neck with the high downforce car closing the gap and exiting with a higher speed. Down this straight though, the lower downforce car flies by this access road doing 178 while its winged brother is left four kilometers in the dust. Through Ascari, the higher downforce car has a slight advantage holding 125 at the same point the car on the left is doing 124. Interesting low, it's only a few meters before the low downforce car is showing its speed again by the exit of that same turn the advantage is flipped. By the 100 meter marker it's no contest, 181 versus 177. 
Apex speed of the Parabolica goes to the higher downforce car as you would expect by 3 kilometers, but it makes little difference as by the exit of the turn the wingless car has made up the pace and it's just getting faster. 3 kilometers per hour faster at the apex of the final turn has become 2 kilometers down by the finish line. I think that's a great example of what downforce brings, but let's study the opposite result, the NSX at Tsukuba. As both cars open the lap, the high downforce car on the right is already down by 2 km per hour. By the apex, the higher downforce car has more speed, but crucially, it's far closer to the ideal racing line. The cars exit just about identically, both on the same part of the track at 148. But in that tiny run up to the next turn, the low DF car takes 2 km per hour out of its high downforce rival. Again, you see the low downforce car run a little wide, and on exit, there's no contest this time. That extra downforce sees that car on the right pull 3 km per hour ahead. But then, going through Dunlop and down to the hairpin, the low downforce car pulls out its own 3 km per hour speed advantage before the braking zone. But it's out of this corner, though, where the real advantage of downforce comes into play. I can freeze the frame right here in the low downforce car is doing 79 versus only 75 for the higher downforce car. But watch what happens now. I get a wobble on exit as the low downforce just doesn't have the traction and by the exit the higher downforce car is smashing it. Even with that exit advantage though, the low downforce car is still faster by the next turn. Through this turn the higher downforce car already has it in the bag. But I want to point out how wide I go here with the high downforce car. It might seem unfair I never went that wide with the lower downforce config, but that's the point I want to make. With the higher downforce car, it just, I just had more confidence. I felt like it would just stick, and as you can see, it did. Driving the car on the left was more tense and I needed to be more careful, especially out of turns and under throttle. I could probably take that final turn just like I did with the higher downforce car, but it would certainly be more risky. Overall, I'm kind of surprised by the similarity in lap times between all sorts of configs and tracks. In my head, I can never quite model it. I mean, it's easy to think that less drag equals more straight line speed. That I get, but then I think, well, more downforce equals more cornering speed, which improves your exits, which improves your straight line speed too. From watching things like F1, you get the impression that the difference between high and low downforce configs is night and day. But then you have to remember that night and day for them can be just a few tenths. One thing I haven't covered here is tire wear. As you can see in the test, the lower downforce car was always a little more loose, always sliding that little bit more. A sliding tire should in theory wear faster, and a higher downforce car should keep its tires fresher longer. But that's a test I have planned for another day. Till then, See you next time.